This is the Camp Iron Mountain Podcast, a place to learn about U.S. military history as told through the stories of service members, military units, and supporting civilians. Join us as we work to preserve their memories for future generations. Hello and welcome back to the Camp Iron Mountain Podcast. I'm your host, Gabriel Suarez. In today's episode, we're going to look at some of the different ways my grandfather's World War II unit veterans tried to preserve their wartime experiences, while also showing how they created an enduring sense of family for anyone connected to their group. Here to share their story is our guest, Dan Langens. Dan lives in Elizabethtown, Pennsylvania, where he's newly retired, at least from his corporate job, but Dan continues to keep himself busy with an assortment of tasks around his farm, including taking care of animals, wood shopping, and continuing some business consulting on the side. Dan is the current editor of the monthly historical newsletter called the Spearhead Doughboy. The Spearhead Doughboy promotes the World War II service history of Company A, 36th Armored Infantry Regiment, 3rd Armored Division. This newsletter project has been in continuous publication since the 1980s, after it was started by the World War II veterans of Company A. The efforts to establish this newsletter and associated unit archive are some of the main stories we'll explore in this episode. As the son of a Company A veteran, Dan enthusiastically took the reins of this ongoing project when the previous Company A veterans who had shepherded it along from the beginning were unable to continue it. Please enjoy our conversation. And I'd like to welcome to the show, Dan Langens. Dan, how's it going, my friend? Pretty good, Gabe. How's the weather in uh, eastern Pennsylvania these days? Uh, we had a little snow, kind of cold, but that's winter. <laughs> yeah, I, I wish you could say the same over here in California. It's uh, it's it's gotten colder, but it's uh, <laughs> definitely the sun comes out every day. And right. There's no right. snow on the ground. Okay, well, let's get started. Dan, I touched upon some of your work you've put in over the years in the introduction, which we'll get to later in the interview. But let's start off with your dad. Lewis Langens. Can you share with us a little of who he was and what his background was growing up? Sure. Um, my father, Lewis, was born in western New York along Lake Erie, uh, August 31st, 1925. And he was raised on a farm there. And the farm was uh, owned by someone else, but my grandfather, who worked for the railroad, uh, took care of the farm. And it mostly was Concord grapes. And then Dad, uh, growing up, uh, helped on the farm. He worked for other farmers in the area. He um, helped a neighbor fellow who had boats that people used to go out fishing on the lake. And so he fished a lot himself. He hunted a lot. Uh, was kind of an outdoors person growing up there in western New York. He was in 4-H and the Boy Scouts and things like that, like a lot of young people were during that time period. And... Uh, from there, I guess maybe we could talk about how he ended up in the Army. Sure. He uh, was drafted in uh, August of uh, 1944. Uh, they had a little get-together, and then he headed down to Camp Croft in South Carolina near Spartansburg. I guess he came home for a little bit. They thought he had a hernia, and this wasn't unusual. I had uncles that said the same thing happened to them, that they sent him home, and then they would come back. So he rejoined the group at Camp Croft, and uh, after the bulge happened, they really sped up training because they needed a lot of people. And so he was sent home in uh, February, early part of February, for a 10-day leave. And then he headed back, and they went to uh, Fort Meade in uh, Maryland, and then they went to Camp Kilmer in New Jersey and took a troop ship over. And from there, they landed in Le Havre. And I know some of this, and we'll talk about it a little later, because I've met some veterans who their dates kind of match up with my father's a little bit. So from Le Havre, he uh, uh, was sent to a replacement depot and then joined Company A uh, in April of 1945. He was only with them a few days because of a non-combat injury to his foot he had. 
And then he came back to the company in Heinstadt, Germany, on May 19, 1945. And then when they started uh, breaking up the 3rd Armored Division, him and a bunch of other guys were sent to the 1st uh, Armored Division. I believe it was the 10th Tank Battalion. Mm-hmm. And then that Tank 10th Battalion became part of the Constabulary. And Dad was uh, in the 72nd Squadron of the Constabulary and ended up being a squad leader with an armored car and uh, three Jeeps under his command. And then came home in July of 1946. What was his life after the war? Um, Dad uh, came home in 1946, and he married my mother in uh, June 18, 1949, Jeanette. And he worked construction, and then he went to work for Niagara Mohawk, a utility company. He was a lineman for them. And that was in the early 50s. And then in the 67, uh, he was promoted from lineman to a safety director, a white collar job, inspecting uh, what fellows were doing, make sure doing the proper things. And we moved to Buffalo, New York, which was about 30 miles north where we'd been living. And he retired from them in 1985. Uh, and so he basically worked his whole life for one company, which is very unusual nowadays. <laughs> very. And, very. And then he uh, retired to Florida where he wanted to uh, go. He uh, had a heart condition and Florida was better for him to get up and walk around. But uh, he passed away uh, June 20th of 2000. Do you mind sharing some of your more cherished memories of him growing up? I uh, I had I was blessed to have wonderful parents. I can say that uh, my mother and father were great people. And I think if the memories that would be interesting for our listeners are probably a few that relate to World War II with him. He had a cartridge belt he brought home from World War II. And in that time period, us kids would all play Army. And I'm talking I was probably eight years old, you know, 10 years old. So he took that cartridge belt and wired it all up so it could fit around a little kid. <laughs> and And I wore that. And... The other kids, some kids had helmets, you know, some kids had canteens their dads brought back. We all had these army things we brought back. And I still have that cartridge belt. I unwired it and have it in my <laughs> my library, but it's very, very uh, special to me, that cartridge belt. The other thing was uh, when I was in Cub Scouts, we'd go on different trips, you know, to a maple syrup farm or something. But one day I went to an armory. And I can see this like it was yesterday. Uh, we went into this armory, and they went into one section. There was an old Sherman tank. It didn't mean anything to me as a kid. But you should have seen those fathers. This is like 20 years after the war. They got so excited. They were talking and climbing all over the tank, you know. <laughs> and as a kid, I didn't get it until I was an adult years later, realized that they were reliving so many of these memories. It was just a fascinating thing to you think back about it, what they were doing. And it was just odd as a kid. You're like, what's wrong with these guys? You know, they're acting like yeah. kids, but they were just having this, this wonderful experience. And they were talking and that, and most of them never, you never heard, heard them talking about the army or service at all, even because so many people had served, but that day they were talking and then, you know, talking about the back of the tank and the radio and stuff like that, you know, the telephone and things like that. I remember them talking about that. So that was a, another memory. And the final one that uh, was really interesting, I've told this story many times, is we were traveling to Florida to see my uh, mother's grandparents. And I was riding up front in a station wagon. My dad was driving, and my grandpa Langhans was sitting next to me. And I had a comic book, which most kids did at that time period, and I was looking through it. And in the back, in the 60s in comic books, they had all kinds of ads about, you know, buying and selling uh you know, artifacts from the war, you know, especially Mm -hmm. German or Nazi artifacts, you know, for sale and all that. And I said, oh, I want to get some of these German things, you know. And my father was a very easygoing person, hardly ever raised his voice. And he snapped at me and he said, you're not getting any of those things. He says, those people did bad things. And it kind of shocked me. I just was like, what? What what are you talking about? And I kind of turned to my grandfather, Langhan, sitting next to me. And he kind of just looked at me and he kind of just shook his head slightly like, your dad's right. You know, without saying it, he's like, you know. And, you know, as a kid, 
I was always, what, what was that all about? Well, then years later, I knew what that was all about. You yeah. Know, that what they had seen uh, in Germany was a, a big impact on them. So, you know, those were a few things that related to my life with my, my father that related back to World War II, you know, in that sense. And uh, I know one of the things you asked about was uh, if I, what I knew about his service. I really didn't know a lot. He had an old Third, third Armor book that has the, a tank coming over the hill and the Germans fleeing. I remember seeing that book one time. He got it out. Mm-hmm. But then in the closet, his coat hung, but he had a patch on it that was the first armor division. Old Ironside. So I always thought he was in the first armor division until one time he turned the coat around. There was the third armor patch spirit on the other side. And I didn't understand that until uh, sort of meeting up with the men from Company A. And they explained, well, when you move from one unit to another, they move the patch over to the other side. Yeah. And on the other arm. And so that's why, you know, I always saw the first armor patch. This is the way it was hanging in the closet. You know, his coat was. So that's so, uh go ahead. So your your dad, I guess like many of his generation, they really didn't talk about the war and you didn't learn much about it while he was alive. No, no. No. My brother asked him a few questions, but dad was very quiet about it. I I don't know the total answer, but a lot of guys were quiet. But one of the things could be is that he had a good friend named George Smith. Mm-hmm. And when he came home on leave, George Smith got married in February. And they had gone into the army together. I have a picture of George. And it was really interesting because this George Smith, I had never knew this man. And my, I asked my mother about this picture after dad was gone. She was, well, that's Egger's brother. Well, Egger Smith was a family friend that we called Uncle Egger even. It was that close. Mm-hmm. And this was his older brother, Egger. And his younger brother was George. Well, George got killed about the same time dad arrived with company A. And he told my mother, he said, if I had gone with George, he says, most of those guys got wiped out. So I don't know, I haven't been able to find out if George and him went over together and if they got split up with the, you know, depot center. Yeah. But that's, I think, you know, that's something that probably weared on my dad that uh, losing a friend like that, somebody close, uh, and just, just didn't talk about it. And the brown yeah. laws and all that never just, they just didn't talk about it much. Once in a while they would say something, but I would say over the years with my dad, I, if he talked about it to once or twice to somebody else, that was it. I've heard a similar story, my grandpa, but I, I never heard it from him. You know, I think I heard it. My grandmother told me, you know, once he passed that uh, there was someone he, he either joined the army with or someone he when he joined company a early on that he knew passed away or, or was killed during the during the war and my grandma said that yeah your, your grandpa you know after the war he he drove to wherever i guess his the his friend's family was and you know met them in person and just talked with the family but you know these life changing events that they never spoke of but were really important to them right right so you mentioned that you didn't really find out a lot of details about your, your father's service until after he passed. And how did you kind of come across, you know, that journey of learning? Well, I think about maybe 2004, uh, Band of Brothers came out, the TV series. Mm-hmm. I, I, it was a weekend my brother came down. We went to the Reading Air Show, which had a huge amount of reenactors. And during that same weekend he was there, we watched Band of Brothers. And it stirred a lot of interest about dad's service. We talked about it. So when I was with my brother one time, he came out with a box from his house and he said, here, you can have this. It's all dad's stuff. I had World War II stuff. Well, within it was Company A newsletters. So I called Bob Paces, who was the editor at the time, and asked if I could be on the mailing list. And Bob and I had a great conversation that night. And then the newsletter started coming. And I um, saw there was a fellow named Clyde Grubb living down near Harrisburg. So I called Clyde and went down and met him, had a great chat, and did two interviews afterwards with Clyde even, a video interview. But what was really interesting, I went down to see Clyde, and he was so excited. And about two weeks later one night, my wife says, there's a phone call for you. It's It's a guy named Clyde Grubb. So I got on the phone and 
So I called. Oh, I just was checking to see how you're doing, wondering how you're doing, you know, and mm-hmm. how are things are going. And I said, great. You know, we talked a little bit and hung up. I said to my wife, that's amazing. I says, I met this guy one time. It's like now I'm part of this family. Yeah. And so Clyde was a real big pusher for me to go to the first company A reunion in uh, 2005 in Charleston, South Carolina. So I drove down myself, didn't know what to expect, you know. But when I walked in that door, it was like uh, a whole new family. It was just greeted so warmly. And uh, you know what that experience is like. You've been there. Yeah, I do. And so it was just, it was a whole new family of people and they've become so close. And it's just been a life changing event in my life uh, just to meet these people. And uh, they are like cousins. We kid each other sometimes. We're like <laughs> cousins, the, the people who are my age, you know, whose fathers are in the unit because yeah. we, we get along and, uh, and that. So that's how I kind of got finding out more about company a and what dad was in from that talking to Bob and then getting involved with some of these guys in the interview. And I, uh, uh, Les Baver was another one I met. He was near the area. I went and interviewed Les and talked to him. Uh, there was a guy named, uh, Harry. I can't think of his last name right now, but, uh, he was a medic for the 43rd medical detachment in the third armor. And he was on the mail list. And I had gone mm-hmm. and, uh, and interviewed him also. Touching on the uh, the reunion part of it, can you give a little background of, from what you know, how long the men of Company A have been getting together for reunions and generally what happens at these things? The, uh, the first reunion started in 1984, I believe. It was in Arkansas. And they had it two years in Arkansas. And how this kind of all started was Frank Simolik, one of the original Company A men, he wanted to get the guys together. They used to go to the third armored division reunions and uh, a company always had their own room. So Frank thought it'd be a great idea to get people together. So he had some guys addresses and he made a newsletter called the spearhead Doughboy, And it was the voice of the men of company a, well, the spearhead Doughboy was the 36 armored infantry regiment newsletter in uh, Europe. They had and yeah. Frank, Frank just took this and added, you know, a voice of company a, so he had one of the men from Company A work for a Bell Telephone in those days. <laughs> and he took the 36 Armored Infantry Directory, and then he would go and look for guys that maybe they were living in the same town still. Yeah. And find their phone numbers and addresses and pass them on to Frank. Just and, just pre, pre-internet, pre right? The phone book. Right, just right. cold the, call people. Well, yeah, he did it through the, the telephone company, basically. <laughs> so, yeah, he'd call them and talk to them and then send them letters and get them on the newsletter, uh, sending it out. And the newsletter in the beginning was just like one page or two pages and mm-hmm. just uh, maybe some stories about World War II or some stories about Company A, maybe a few pictures. Frank, you know, put it on a copier with things he cut and pasted and all that. And I don't believe Frank had a phone himself. That's why he mailed so much stuff. (laughs) But Frank would send you an audio cassette. And that's how he would communicate sometimes with people. He'd send audio cassettes to you and have you send a cassette back to him. And I have some of those cassettes and I have recorded them over into digital format. And it's really interesting because he's got a lot of stories. He's got stories about Camp Polk where they started out and all that kind of stuff. So that's how the... The reunions kind of got started, and uh, we've had a reunion every year except for this year, 2020, because of COVID-19. And uh, we move around to different parts of the country. Mm -hmm. And when I joined, there was probably 12 veterans coming, you know, but it's been 15 years. A lot of them have passed away, and a lot of them can't travel anymore. And Mm -hmm. basically, we were down to about two veterans who've been coming of late. But their families come children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and we still get together with each other. So that's how the the reunions kind of started up. So for the newsletter, how was it paid for all these years? Uh, Donations. People just send checks in on it. It's always been just donations. And how I ended up becoming the the editor, I'll explain that to you a little bit maybe, was Frank Smolik had been the editor, then he passed. He got started to get sick and he passed it on to Bob Paces. Bob took it over. And Bob 
was was doing the newsletter and and things were going fine but then bob started to have some trouble with his computer operator error <laughs> well i just it just was having problems and he couldn't get the newsletter out in time and we were at a reunion uh i think in 2009 and he said he was going to give it up stop it he told people that night well, i went to bed this was at a reunion i went to bed and i thought about it a lot so the next day i got up and i talked to bob i said to him i'd like to continue this on Mm -hmm. And I explained to Bob that I think that we need to keep this history alive. We need to keep passing it down through the generations to someone because, you know, my great grandchildren may be looking for information about my father someday and somebody else's great grandchildren. And we and it'd be great to have a place they could go to and find this out. And for me, I know this is really comes true because we have a gentleman in our family who has done a lot of history of the Civil War for our family. And my great great grandfather is included and my wife's great great grandfather and from him i have a diary notes from my wife's great great grandfather who served with sherman i have letters from my great great grandfather who joined sherman in atlanta and fought to the sea and back up through the carolinas mm -hmm. there's, there's these letters and i never knew they existed my father never knew they existed hmm. and pictures and all that so you start to make these connections with people and you can find out more things. And so I said to Bob, we need to keep this alive so we can continue these connections that people can go. And as you and I've talked of, you know, a web page or something that people can go and if they put in a search for a name or a, a unit, they might find out there's this whole huge amount of data about their ancestor in the service that they never knew existed and pictures, mm. you know, or, sto or stories or. Yeah interviews that they didn't even know exist. So that's how I took it over and uh, why uh, why I did it. Yeah, and and you've done a a fantastic job over the years collecting the stories and and doing the research um based on these stories that they provided. I guess can you share some of the projects, you know, you've been able to accomplish over the years as the editor? I think we've we've collected over a 1000 pictures and we were trying to get the pictures ID the best we could with the veterans you know, having them look at them. Yeah. We, uh, Bob Paces did some audio cassette interviews and I'm digitizing those. He typed out the, the interviews. There's stories that people have written. We've collected the stories and put them into book form and they're in PDF forms. I've done some video interviews with veterans. And one of the things we've had some really fantastic time with is we've used Google Earth at the reunions and we'd get together in a room and I would put a projector with a screen on the wall and we'd get one of the veterans to say, okay, we want to go someplace where you were. And in Belgium, you can drop a, a man on the road and you can see Germany is mm -hmm. still just maps. But like we had a, uh, one day we had a uh, talk about the bulge and company A and Bob Pace's talk. And so what we did was I dropped Bob into near Ammonine, Belgium and this road. And Bob was sitting up front where he could see the road. And I says, okay, Bob, take us through the story. So Bob starts talking. He goes, okay, we, company A headed down this road. Now you're going to come to a, a, a road to the left. There's a little bridge there. I left two guys to guard that bridge. Mm -hmm. So we moved the man down the road. We turned the little man and look, and sure enough, there's a little bridge. <laughs> then he says, up ahead here is going to be a hairpin turn where we met the Grenadiers, certain German unit, you know. Yeah. And sure enough, to go up and there's the hairpin turn. He explains how we go through the woods. And so we're seeing this as he's telling the story. And he did this with Etchenhoven and different stories. And then uh, Malcolm Buck Marsh, who they call Shorty, he did the same thing about different places he was. We would project it on the screen and he would talk about it. And so that has been a really, really fascinating thing. Captain Berlin's two daughters were at the reunion when Bob talked about Etchenhoven. That's where Captain Berlin received his Distinguished Service Cross. And uh, so that was fascinating for them because they never knew anything about it. And so that's some of the things we've done. And I know that someone like you can take it another step for us by compiling all this data mm -hmm. and and maybe even making more of it. I, I, I truly believe it's it's there to take to another level. It, it, uh, I'm not as technically skilled in that sense. And I think a person like yourself can take it up for another level and it'll be great stuff for people. I really do. 
No, I appreciate it, Dan. That's one of the highlights I've, I've been looking forward to as I finish up, get ready to retire next year is taking that over and, and, and really getting in the weeds. And I think for a lot of the future, like you said, you know, getting it on online so it's more accessible to, to others and just your, your digitization efforts have, have been amazing. Not only just with the photos, but digitizing the old newsletters, typing out the stories that they did. But I think, like you said, the the next level stuff is building databases with these stories and names and then the visualization part of, you know, with these new tools like Google and, and other programs, you know, to, to visualize the actual terrain where they were and able to, to use their stories and then place them on the map and, and figure out exactly where they were. I think that is the, the way of the future. Yes, it's. We did that with the where the first men were were killed at Company A. We think we found the crossroad. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had a, we used Google, but we also had a, a gentleman from Belgium who went and took pictures of the intersection. And from the writings of the fellows, we think we pinpointed the the intersection. So the, some of those things we're we're doing now, you've used those. Uh, you got me those overlays of the maps, and by having those of Ammonine and that, we were able to Bob explain a little better what they what they did, uh, where they were, the patrols went and things like that. So yeah, there's some great stuff out there. Yeah. And I think to really understand their reach, it wasn't just, you know, them internally with their company, you know, they, they did stuff with, with other uh, companies in the 36 and the other regiments of the third armor, but they, you know, they made friends with a lot of folks in, in Belgium and in France and Germany that helped them along these years with their research as well. Mm-hmm. Yep. You know, um, the company was activated in February of uh, 1941 at Camp Beauregard, I think is the name of it, in Louisiana. Mm-hmm. And then they uh, moved to Camp Polk, June 13th, 1941, and were there for a while doing a lot of training. And uh, then they left and went to, I think it's was Frida, California, was they went in July of 1942 for desert training. Yeah, and that's where I get the name of the this podcast. Uh, camp Iron Mountain is the camp they were at in the desert. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if you knew this, but uh, there was like seven trains a regiment went on. And I asked Walt about this, Walt Kamick, one of the originals. And he said that they were the guards for the 3rd Armored on those trains, Company A was. <laughs> and they, I have video of a, a company moving on a train. And they sat outside. You know, they worked like coveralls. A lot of them had coveralls on. Mm-hmm. And they sat outside and that. And a, and a funny story before I move on to that, but at Camp Polk, a lot of guys came from Chicago to the 3rd Armored Division. And Walt Kamick, which I mentioned, one of the originals, and Frank Samolik was from Chicago, and quite a few guys, and um, had never handled weapons before in their life. Well, they went out, and Walt and them became expert on the Tommy gun. Well, the rumor mill started flying through Camp Polk. Some Al Capone's guys are here, you know. <laughs> and Walt thought it was so funny. He says, we didn't, never even handled a gun before. <laughs> but because they were from Chicago and they did so well with the Thompson machine gun, the rumor was that they were some of Capone's guys, he says. So that was kind of funny. Um, and then when they went to California, one of the things that's interesting, Hugh Cannon explained to me that he was pulled one day, his squad, and they went and picked up Japanese farmers and took them to the Santa Ana racetrack in California where they were interned for the war. That's crazy. I, yeah, I didn't know that. Yep. It wasn't everybody. It was just some certain squads. And he, he explained, he said, yeah, it wasn't everybody. He says, they just pulled some, some squads and we went and took our half tracks and went around to farms and loaded the people up into the half tracks and their furniture a little bit and took them to the racetrack. And then they interned them into the, the horse stalls. They built little apartments for the people there at the, the racetrack. So, you know, as Bob told me one time, he says, you know, uh, every platoon was doing something different in the in combat and every squad was doing some things different, you know. So you could mm-hmm. be on one street and nothing's happening in the street over, those guys are really getting hit. And just like this, it's sometimes interviewing the veterans and they did something that, that nobody else even knew they did, like this taking the Japanese and uh, moving them. 
Yeah, I know that that's pretty big over here in, in California. I used to hear those stories. My grandparents worked on the Japanese farms and mm -hmm. my grandmother, you know, they used to tag along with, with their father and, and brothers with they work and, you know, play with them and went to school with them. And then the first one told me, you know, about the, the evacuation when they arrested them and basically gave them a week to have to sell all their property and, and took them to the camps. Yeah. But well, when they left California, they went to Camp Pickett, arrived there in October, end October, I think it was uh, 43. And then they went to Indian Town Gap in January, as a matter of fact. Uh, that's when they went to Pennsylvania. And then over to England, I think it was in September of 43 and went up to a place called Sutton Venny, England, and uh, trained there. And one funny story from there was Walt Kamick told me, was they joined the golf club <laughs> in that area. And I says, the golf club? Yep, joined the golf club. I said, did you play golf? Nope. <laughs> he says, see, he says, they had a quota on, on liquor in the towns for the servicemen, but if you drank, went to the golf club, you could get any, you could buy as much as you wanted at the golf club. <laughs> he said, so a bunch of us went to the golf club. We never played golf, you know, but, uh, you know, you're just young guys, you know, I mean. Yeah, I know. That, we forget how young most of them were. Oh, wow, yes. 18, 19, yeah, 20. You know, they were just young guys having a good time, you know, and that's, that's, but just those funny little stories that have come out and there's thousands of them in every unit about things that happen. And then uh, from England, you know, they went on LST 524 to France and uh, unloaded on Omaha Beach around the 22nd of 1944. Worked their way through Belgium, the Bulge, you know, Germany. And then uh, on April 27th, 1945, that was their last day of combat. There was no more combat after that mm -hmm. point. Like you said, you know, most of them are, have passed away. few that are surviving are in their, are in their 90s. Late 90s, yeah. I think the stories you're able to to capture and the work that they started so long ago in trying to save their their own stories for the future, it's still bearing fruit even today. Do you mind sharing the story about Shorty finding the uh, the son of their Ford observer on one of oh, the last days in battle? Right, right. Uh, they had left uh, Paderborn. Mm -hmm. First part of April, they had been fighting in Paderborn, left Paderborn. Lieutenant Hart had been wounded, who was their forward observer, and uh, Lieutenant Sarver came up to be their forward observer then. Now, for years, they used to tell this story, and he called the man Sun Slimmer. So, uh, story, do you want me to tell the story what happened to, to Sarver? Sure. Yes, go ahead. So, so um, they left Paderborn, it was at night, and the column was coming down through a road, and all of a sudden, a shell come up the road. And it was an armor-piercing round, they could tell because of the color of it coming up through. Artillery shell. So they dismounted the half-tracks. The half-tracks backed up the road. And Company A kind of started down the road. And uh, out of the night darkness, someone yelled, Halt! And when they did, the guys all kind of just laid off to the left-hand side of the road. And when they did, they noticed there was all these pine branches and that. So they realized that the Germans had been cutting trees for a roadblock up ahead. So they were laying there in the road, and all of a sudden, they could hear this, this someone walking. And they knew it was a German because of the hobnail boots on the road. And Malcolm Shorty Marsh was up probably like, oh, I think he was maybe third or fourth up in the line. He was the lead scout. And this German come walking up the road, and Captain Berlin was pretty far up front, and he and he didn't shoot him, so Shorty knew not to <laughs> shoot him. And this guy starts going, Hans, Hans. And at the same time, Shorty's noticing that there's a light someplace. Well, unknown to him, he had a flashlight in his pocket, and the light had turned out. Oh, no. So this German's yelling, Hans, Hans. And he had his gun over his shoulder, and. Uh, he was kind of looking into the, the brush to see, you know, if it was Hans. Well, he must have realized he was in a bad spot, so he just turned around and walked back slowly. <laughs> and as soon as he got down the road, they opened up machine gun fire down the road. So Captain Berlin uh, told him to start crossing the road. 
And so they started crossing the road to make their way into a ditch. And in the process, uh, Lieutenant Sarver was hit. And he was out in the field yelling for help. And the medics went out, tried to get out. The guys tried to get out every time the Germans would open up on them. And they couldn't get to him. And when they finally did get to him, he had passed away. And it was a mortal wound. The, the medic said they couldn't have saved him. It was that bad of a yeah. wound. So for years, I was trying to figure out this story, where it happened, when it happened. Um, so I could, was my dad there or not? You know, I was kind of wondering. Mm-hmm. And But I couldn't find this lieutenant, Sunslimmer, in any records passed away. that was killed in action. So one day, I keep searching the internet for different things. And all of a sudden, the 67th Field Artillery after action reports were on the uh, the internet finally. And I was able to get a hold of them. Well, the report shows how Hart was injured and Lieutenant Sarver had gone mm. and joined Company A, not Sun Slimmer. And so I found pictures of Sarver on the internet because he'd played baseball before the the war. Okay. I showed I showed the pictures to uh, Dick Snyder and to uh, Malcolm Marsh, and they didn't recognize him. So then I found some more pictures of him with his hat off. And once they saw him with his hat off, they said, that's Sun Slimmer. I said, well, <laughs> it's Sun Slimmer to you, but it's Sarver. Yeah. And so we uh, we realized that we had they had the name wrong for years. Because once they saw him without his hat, they recognized him, his hair and all that. Yeah. You know, but with a helmet on, they just they couldn't pick it out. It had been, you know. 70 plus 70 years. years. Yeah. Yeah. So then um, I forget how... I looked on the internet someplace and there was something about a uh, World War II memorial for Sarver and it was put there by his brother. So we found his brother's address and um, we were able to get in contact with him and he met with Malcolm Marsh and uh, Malcolm tried not to tell him too much about what happened to his brother, Mm -hmm. but uh, they got together. I, I, I think I got that right. It was his brother. I don't think it was his son. I'd have to look that back up, Gabe, just to be sure. Because I've had this happen a couple other times with some people. Yeah, yeah. I think this might have been a, a son, but I'm not sure. I apologize for not no, knowing that. It's okay. That. I, I thought I remembered it as a son, but either way, I think it's just fascinating, even that 70 plus years later that we're still able to provide some information or, you know, some sense of comfort to know what someone's relative who, who never came back, you know, what they went through the last few days. Yeah, that's because in the book, The Spearhead, that happened again where someone saw a name of someone who was killed and a guy read the book and he told the guy, he says, there's a story about your brother in the book. Mm-hmm. And that fella was a younger brother, I know, of the fellow who died. And uh, okay, uh, Malcolm and him got together also and uh they just they knew nothing about what happened to him where it was and all that and he was able to fill him in as to what happened so i know that was a younger brother because he told his younger brother when he left for service you know make the basketball team and don't drink and smoke and the guy says i i kept that that i made the basketball team and i didn't smoke or drink like my brother told me so yeah so yeah there's it'll continue to happen i think things like that yeah i guess from your perspective All the efforts you've put in over the years, collecting the Company A stories, scanning their pictures, doing the other history aspects of it. For anyone that's listening, you know, how how would you explain to them, is this replicable for anyone who's motivated to do it? Not just World War II, but, you know, even like current veterans or, you know, Korea, Vietnam, any type of era. I think uh, I think it is. I think that with the internet has really helped a lot. Like I said, those 67 field artillery reports came out and that helped finish the puzzle. Well, we had a good start because these guys had been together so long Mm -hmm. and we have this oral history. So if you want to do it about Vietnam veterans or Gulf War veterans, you need to talk to them today, not tomorrow. Yeah. It's really important. Uh, And like I said, you know, how fast we've lost so many of them in company A that, you know, we would have loved to talk to still about stories. So mm-hmm. I think it's possible for somebody to go out and, and do this. And it doesn't matter if it's World War II or family history. I, I went around and interviewed, after my dad passed away, I got to thinking about it. I went around and interviewed all my aunts and uncles about World War II. Mm-hmm. And then I interviewed and then I interviewed him about growing up. Yeah. And just these wild stories that come out 
Like my one aunt would tell about her and her husband that he, he was with the 104th Timberwolves. They went to Colorado. She worked in the laundry with German POW. Wow. You know, and they were a, a very stoic aunt and uncle, very serious all the time. And I'm interviewing them, and they're talking about when they were first married, had to go to Colorado and slept in a little single bed. And they're laughing about this. And I'm sitting there going, who are these people? <laughs> and I think what this does, when you start going out and asking these questions and talking to people, you just find out so much more about them that maybe you didn't even think about. And, you know, they were young people, 20 years old. We don't think that sometimes, you know, that they were young yeah. too, like we were. So I think you can do it. I really do. I think anybody could do it. Final question. What would you want listeners to take away from your experiences working with the Company A veterans? Oh, that's an interesting question. I think that when you get involved in something like this, this was another whole family of people that uh, I, I've never felt anything like it. When I walked into that room, I became their family. And uh, like I said, they would, the phone calls from them, just the greetings, the, the warmth from them. I think that uh, it has been such a wonderful experience. And uh, my wife didn't go to the first reunion, which she went again, another one, and she saw it. Uh, my children have seen it. I had my brother come one time, too, and he, he saw it. And so many other siblings, I shouldn't say siblings, children of parents who maybe even uh, aren't in, have passed away when they've come. They just, this wonderful feeling. We take them in mm -hmm. as part of the family because we're connected. The guys from Company A were connected. And my dad was at the end of the war. And guys, you know, there was like six, seven hundred guys went through Company A. So even though you didn't know each other, you just you were in the unit, you know. And then your dad was in the unit, so you're part of this family. Mm -hmm. It's really a really special experience, it really is. So I guess from that is that I think it changed my life uh, that I've become involved in this, and I'm glad I have because I think it uh, I was the right person at the right time for Company A to. to to move it the next step along, mm -hmm. you know, by, by, by doing the Google maps and those kind of things, they've said that they, it's all of a sudden just opened up whole new things for them and got them excited again about talking about things. Yeah. Well, Dan, thank you very much for joining us today. Well, Gabe, I really enjoyed it. I think it's really special what you're doing and uh, continue doing this great work because it'll be uh, passed on to people and they'll be, um, people wanting to know more, I think, as time goes on. About a great group of guys. Great group of guys. Yes, I, I look forward to it. And, and I look forward to, to seeing you in person, hopefully sometime soon. Yes, well, I, think, <laughs> I think we'll all look forward to seeing each other in person <laughs> sometime. If you like what you've heard and would like to support our podcast, please subscribe and leave a review on Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast player you're listening to us on. The positive reviews help others find the show. Please visit our website at campironmountain.com and subscribe to our email list. On our website, you will also find the links to join our private Facebook group and other social media sites. Stop by and leave a comment, ask questions, or provide ideas for future podcasts. Join our efforts to preserve the important memories of our veterans and civilians for future generations. 